Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Peaches are delicious, but they're hard to grow because they're susceptible to many insects and diseases. Today, we're going to identify the most common. Also, bees are important to pollinators. Today, we will take a tour of a beehive. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. D. Mr. D is a retired UT County Director. Yeah. And David Glover will be joining me later. All right, Mr. D, let's talk about one of your favorite subjects, huh? We're going to talk about peaches, peaches aren't we? That's right. You oh, like peaches, man. don't you? Dr. Arlie Powell at Auburn University used to say peaches are the queen mm. of the fruit. Queen. Oh, and they are. They are, they they are really, are really I good. I like that. all kinds of fruit, but uh, peaches are, are super, super good. But they, they have a lot of issues. They right? are. They are hard to grow. Yes. My hat is off to commercial mm -hmm. peach producers. I would agree with that. Because they have insects and diseases. You know, a lot of fruits have insects and diseases. Peaches have one or two insects that can kill them. Kill and they have one or two diseases uh -huh. that can kill them. Wow. And uh, if you don't control those, then, then you're gonna have real problems. So let's talk about diseases of peaches. And we're gonna uh -huh. start with brown rot. Okay, well brown rot affects the twigs, it'll affect the leaves, and it affects, affects the fruit. On the fruit, it gets its name, <laughs> brown rot, from the way it looks on the fruit. Yeah. The whole peach will turn it brown. It'll start in as, as a little small spot on the uh -huh. peach and it will spread and it will eventually envelop the entire peach, the entire, and it's just a brown rot. And on leaves, the way it affects leaves is the spots on the leaves and the spots will grow. And, and uh, the twigs, uh, discoloration uh, on the twigs, the, the, they'll die. Actually, the fuzz on a peach the fuzz actually interferes with the, right. the uh, spore okay. attaching. Right. And a nectarine is naked. Right, right. It doesn't have yeah, any fuzz on it. You're and right. so okay. brown okay. rot is worse on, on, uh, on nectarines yeah. than they are on peaches. Mm -hmm. If you see symptoms of brown rot, uh -oh. too late. Too late. I You're didn't know say it. So that's why <laughs> we go with preventative fungicide applications on peaches. Okay, wow. All right. So let's roll over to peach leaf curl. What does that look like? Peach leaf curl is it's pretty self-explanatory. The leaves will, will kind of curl and, and uh, they'll be light, discolored. They'll be yellow yeah, and, and, and they'll eventually fall off. So let's talk a little bit about phony peach. So what is that? Okay, phony peach is a devastating disease of peaches. Uh, it uh, spends part of its life cycle on a plum tree and part of its life cycle on a peach tree. and. Uh, it will kill both of them. On tr plum trees, it's called plum leaf scald. Okay. Right. Um, on peach trees, it's phony peach. And the symptom that you'll see, you know, peach leaves are folded, uh -huh. kind of like a boat. Right. Uh -huh. If they open up and they're flat and they don't have that fold to them, that's a good indication that you might have phony peach. And it's caused by a rickettsia type organism that's spread by leaf hoppers. Mm feeds on a plum tree and then feeds on a peach tree and it spreads that organism. Uh, that's why we don't recommend planting plum trees next to peach trees and also even wild plums, if they're close, uh, can be a vector or, or, or uh, a source of infection. Okay, so let's get to the insect pest. Okay. Curculio. You like to talk about that one a lot. Plum curculio, yeah. the most devastating yeah. uh, insect that uh, affects peaches, plums, and nectarines. Mm -hmm. The symptom of that is, is really easy. On a small yeah. fruit, you'll see a little crescent-shaped scar because the adult will land on the fruit, she'll cut a little opening, and then she'll lay an egg underneath that flap and go on about her business. <laughs> and that egg will hatch, the little larvae, will, or grub, yeah. will uh, burrow throughout the fruit and you know eventually damage the whole fruit. And so, meaning ah. most of the time, the fruit will fall off. 
But if you go out there, if you haven't been spraying your peaches and you go out there and there's a little crescent-shaped scar uh, on the fruit, it's already infected. So is, yeah, it again, is it pretty easy to see? It's pretty easy to okay. see. Very easy Visible? to see. Okay. Very easy to see. Mm -hmm. uh, how about that? From the old plum cuculio. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move to the peach scale. Peach scale is a white, scaly substance. Peach scale is one of the insects that can kill peach trees. Mm -hmm. Every limb that the scale completely encircles will die. If it completely encircles the trunk of the tree, the trunk will die. Now, in our area, here in the Memphis area, there are three generations of peach scale per year. Okay. You get further south down toward the Gulf Coast, they have four generations wow. per year. Okay. The crawlers, that, as these generations occur, the crawlers are easy to kill. Okay. The, the malathion will kill them. And, and, but when you see the white adult structures on the plant, insecticides can't yeah. get to the scale and they're pretty much ineffective. Oil, mm -hmm. the oils uh, will, you know, if you spray with oil, that will take care of That's the adult. But if, you, if you're at the point where you've already got the adult showing up there, you, you better get to work with the oils very, very quickly. <laughs> All right, so let's get to the boar. Peach tree Peach boar. Tree boar. Insect number two that yeah. can kill your tree. Uh, symptom of a peach tree borer is uh, gum mm. oozing out of the base or the lower trunk of a peach tree. What it is that that tree is trying to flush that borer out. And it's like you get something in your eye, your tears trying to flush it out, but it, can, it, it won't do it. It can't do it. All right, so let's talk about how to treat for these. Okay. From UT, okay. UT's right. uh, Home Orchard Spray Guide, uh, the cover sprays, uh, basically captan yeah. or sulfur plus malathion. Yeah. You know, okay. that's, what, that's what we recommend for cover sprays. Right. Chlorothalonil mm -hmm. is uh, also recommended during, during bloom. Right. To spray fruit trees, you, you do it correctly, you need to go with a, a dormant spray uh, oil uh, during, during dormancy. Okay. At bloom, you need to go in and spray with the captan. Do not mix insecticides with your fungicide during Good bloom, point. anytime that's blooming, because we don't want to hurt the honeybees. Right. But, but fungicides don't do that, and it's important to apply fungicides during bloom. Uh, the petal, at petal fall, when most of the petals have fallen off, go back in there with, and I would probably mix it up a little bit. You could use captan, but sulfur okay. or chlorothalonil is, is recommended at petal fall. When the petals are all off, okay. Include your insecticide, your malathion. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's where you could could go with a regular home orchard spray that's that's already mixed up for you. I prefer to to mix my own because if you use the same home orchard mm. spray all the time, you're using the same fungicide all the time, right. and and you you may get some resistance issues. So I, I don't like that. So that's why I would I would have me some captan and I would have some chlorothalonil. Gotcha. Those are the two that I personally would use. Okay. And so, so we talk petal fall, use either captan or chlorothalonil plus malathion. <laughs> and then when the shuck splits, same thing, captan or sulfur okay. or chlorothalonil plus malathion. And then when the fruit forms, and this is seven to ten days later, <laughs> either captan or, or sulfur plus malathion. And you do that throughout the growing season. Every seven to ten days. Mm. If it doesn't rain, uh. you can stretch it out to ten days. Right. If it rains, just assume you didn't spray. You want to keep a protective coat, protective coat of fungicide, and and and, and uh, the insecticide really needs to be there for when to to meet the plum curculio when she's <laughs> looking for a place to lay her egg. Hopefully, there's there's malathion there on right. that little fruit when she lands. Now. It's a lot of spraying. In already. addition to the cover sprays, and, and this is up into, you know, to close to harvest, sure. you know. Uh, but in addition to control the uh, peach tree borer, you need to use uh, an esfenvalerate or gamma cyhalothrin, one of these two insecticides. You spray the trunk and lower uh, limbs of, of the peach tree May 31st, June 30th, and July 15th. Okay. And, and, and that's when the... Uh, the female's gonna yeah. be out there trying to lay eggs on the bark or on yeah. the lower portion of that tree. 
and then you can do an, another application after harvest. You don't want to apply this within 14 days of harvest, so depending on the variety that you've got. Now, there are a lot of problems you don't see with peaches if you go with a regular spray program. Right. But you definitely have to have a spray program. You've got to have a spray program. Thank you, Mr. D. That's really good information. Yeah. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the chrysanthemum lace bug. So you might be familiar with um, lace bugs from azaleas. We see those quite often, azalea lace bug damage. However, this is a different type of lace bug that is specific to plants that are in um, the family of chrysanthemums. So this plant is actually an aster. It's in that same family. And you can see we've got some general yellowing here. Uh, these symptoms are called stipling. This is a sucking insect. And um, so uh, we got to look at it and we certainly found them. Here they are, chrysanthemum lace bugs feeding on an aster. So to treat this chrysanthemum lace bug, um, you could use an insecticidal soap, or a general purpose insecticide like permethrin, um, and I would do that as soon as possible. All right, Mr. David. Hey. We're, We're back. Get up to them, huh? This is a little different. The bee suits. In bee suits. Right. We're actually in bees. A um, couple of things real quickly okay. before we even start. Uh, one thing that is really hard for new beekeepers is keeping their smoker lit. Okay. Now, why do you need a smoker? To alert the bees. Now, alert, not alert. Well, alert. kind of. Gotcha. You may okay. want to think about it. Most people think smoke is a calming effect on okay. bees. It doesn't. It actually confuses their ability to talk to each other. All the kids know about the waggle dance and how bees tell other <laughs> bees about where flowers are, but bees really communicate with pheromones. Those are smells that mean something. Well, we generally can't smell what the bees are saying, so what we can smell is smoke. Okay. Smoke is louder than anything the bees can say. And the first thing that we do when we get into the bees is we smoke them a little bit. That yeah. smoke confuses their ability to talk to each other. The guard bees can't tell the other bees that we're in them. And some of the bees will actually take that smoke and realize there's a fire somewhere. Okay. And they'll go into the hive and suck up as much honey as they can. It distends their abdomens. And bees have to extend their stinger to sting. Uh -huh. and when their bellies are full, they can't they push can't out their that. stinger, okay. so they're confused and they can't sting us. The smoker is very important and keeping it lit while you're working is even more important because once the bees are looking at us, that means they know we're here. Okay. There's a little bit of smoke across the top of them and they go back to doing what they were doing. Well, let's make sure we keep that smoker on, man. So we smoked let's them in the front. That. We've waited about 60 seconds. We're gonna lift the back. All right. Put a little smoke under here. Okay. And the reason we're opening this hive is because I just got these bees from somebody's house last week. Okay. And we want to see how they're progressing. One thing that we look at as the bees come and go from the entrance, you can learn a lot about what's going on with the bees. If they have pollen on their legs, that means they have babies. Hmm. If they have babies, that means they probably have a laying queen. Okay. Pollen is protein. Everything needs protein to grow. Okay. Okay. So we watch that. We watch the activity. Is there any arguing going on in front? Is anybody fighting? <laughs> Bees defend their hive. Okay. If there's no hive movement up front, no arguing, then they're not stressed. Well, there's some bees. Wow, how about that? And this is a hive tool. Neat factors on this is you can use this to break apart pieces of wood that the bees have glued together. together. Okay. Hear that popping? Yeah, I heard it. Okay. Now, how would you think the bees are doing? Right now, we've got bees, so okay. they're alive. So they're alive, okay. You see how they're looking up at us? See the uh -huh. eyes? I see that. Just a little bit of smoke, and down they go. Wow, they went straight down. Okay. okay. When we open a hive, Man. we start on the outside and work in. Okay. Now, this is a new hive. I'm not expecting much movement in here, but this is what we would do. Pry the bar apart. This goes right here and jacks oh, up man. the side of the frame. Not expecting anything on this frame because it's brand new. Okay. Slide this frame over and keep sliding over to see what the bees are doing. So as you're sliding those over though, but that's not bothering the bees? No, because okay. they're doing their thing. Okay. Okay, right. lift this up. See okay. the glistening in there? I see it. That's nectar. Neat. That's going to be honey. Neat. Nectar comes from flowers. 
and it's the liquid source in the flower that draws the bees in. Okay. As the bees are digging around getting nectar, the pollen in the flower is actually getting stuck to the little hairs on their bodies. And when they leave that flower and go to the next flower, that causes pollination. The okay. pollen transfers. That causes our fruits and our vegetables to grow. Now, see this real fat bee right here? I see it. That's a drone. That's okay. a boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Pretty good size. If you look too. at him, Man. see how big his eyes are? I see that. His whole head is just about all eyes. He's got one purpose in life, and that's to find a new queen and mate with her. So he needs all those eyes to see her. How about that? He sits in the hive all day long until about two o'clock in the afternoon, sucking up honey. Wow. Around two o'clock in the afternoon, all the drones leave the hive and they go to a place called a drone congregation hour area, a DCA. <laughs> DCA. <laughs> it's sort of like a smoker lounge for bees. <laughs> and they kind of hang out and wait for a new queen to come. Now, how does she find them? There's not a big neon sign up there, but there's pheromones a trail of pheromones where the boys have flown and she follows straight to them. And when she shows wow. up, game is on. Wow. Huh. They will chase her. That and the first 12 to 20 drones that catch up with her will mate with her. And she stores up all of that genetic material inside her body in a very special organ called a spermatotheca. And coming from her intestines is a tube that feeds sugar to them. Okay. And it keeps those sperm viable for up to five years. Whoa. Crazy. Man, that is wild. One mating, and that's it for her. Wow. That's so it. That's, that's it for, we're going to go one more box down. That's it for her. She never leaves the hive again unless the hive feels constricted or congested. And she will leave with half the colony and go find a new home. Okay. That's what happens in the spring and summer. It's called swarming. Okay. They're looking for a new home. So it'll be a big cluster of bees hanging on a tree or a mailbox or somebody's car. They don't have anything to defend, so they're not going to get, they're not going to sting you unless you go mess with them. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, even here, bees are defensive. They're only going to defend their hive and their honey. They're not going to come look at you like wasp or yellow jackets will. Yes. Okay. I've been a witness to that one. We're going to go down one more box. This box is the box of frames and comb that we got from the house. A lot more action in here. When we take comb out of a house, we got to do something with it. Rubber bands hold it in place. So everyone that has the X on it is a rubber banded comb. Okay. These on the outside are just fillers that we put in so that they have everything they need to grow. Ah. Plastic foundation. Bees build wax on top of this. They build it out. How neat is that? They'll do it on both Man. sides. We'll set that right here. Go over one more. And now that looks good. That's a lot of bees down in there. That's also a lot of honey. Wow. Huh. See the white caps? I do. That white is honey. Okay. Earlier we had liquid. Once it gets to about 17% moisture, once the bees have dried it out, they cap it over with wax. Wow. And that's their honey. And again, Impressive. two fat drones. I see them. A lot of workers. In a hive of 40,000 bees, you may have 1,000 boys. 1,000. How long before the bees can make honey, though? Well, almost immediately. OK. When they set up a new hive, there, there are bees that are building wax and bees that are going to the field. And they're bringing food in as fast as they can. So this is comb that was in somebody's house. Wow. See the tan pockets? Uh -huh. Those are babies. Those are brood Okay. that are just about to hatch. They go through the same four metamorphic stages that butterflies go through. Egg, larva, uh -huh. pupa, pupa, adult. adult. Right. They actually spin a cocoon inside the wax. And that's the cap over the cocoon. Wow. But this was in somebody's house last week. And they'll eventually fill this whole area out with wax. And once they do, then we won't have to worry about these spare pieces sticking off the side. I'll set that there. That is so impressive. Now, David, before we have to leave, mm -hmm. I noticed there are a few dead bees lying on the ground. Yes. Uh, new beekeepers may look at that and go, oh my gosh, somebody sprayed my bees. Or they've gotten into a pesticide. Bees work themselves to death. Okay. 
and sometimes they'll die inside the hive and when they do another bee will carry that dead bee outside the hive and drop it on the ground well the entrance is right here so there are a few dead bees on the ground okay what I'm looking for right now is evidence that the queen is laying. We're looking for eggs and larvae. Right here is the queen. Huh. Right here, going down. Going down, I see it. It doesn't take long for her to lay an egg. The queen lays about 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. Literally, her body weight every day in eggs. How impressive is that? Mr. David, we appreciate this. This has been outstanding. In fact, it's been- Outstanding in the field. Unbelievable, <laughs> how about that? Thank yes. you much. You're very welcome, thank y'all. Rule number one, if you're gonna use a hoe, don't wear flip-flops, wear you some good boots. Rule number two, don't do more work than is necessary. The goal to killing weeds is to get the plant out by the roots like that and then get make sure that root is exposed and the sun will kill it that is not the way to do it that weed even that is not the way to do it that weed will survive it will come back strong you may have to use the corner of the hoe May have to do a little bit more work, but get that root out. Right there it is, and he'll die. All right, Mr. D, our Q&A segment, you ready? Let's do it. We have some great questions here. What is this on the leaves of my peach tree, and what should I spray on it? Thank you. This is Mike from Rutherford, Tennessee. All right, so the peach tree. That would be again. Rutherford if you're from the area. Rutherford, Rutherford if you're from the area. Uh, yeah, that, that is classic bacterial oh, spot. Yeah. Yes, it is. And uh, when you see the little purplish tint mm -hmm. to it, now those, those spots will, they'll continue to develop and then the center will fall out mm -hmm. and you'll be able to hold the leaf up to the sun and yeah. it's like a shot hole appearance. Yeah. The yeah. center of the, uh, the spots will fall out. But, uh, Bacterial spot on peaches, uh, some varieties are more susceptible to others, and uh, uh, so you may not see it on some varieties, but uh, you need to use one of the copper compounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Coside is, is one, but make sure it's got some copper uh, present. If you, you know, go to a reputable nursery, or whatever, they will have that. That's right. Know, copper fungicide. Right. Right. Read uh, and follow the label, of course. Follow the label. That's right. Uh, when you're out there applying, and again, you know, you like to mention if it rains in between there, would well, it never happen, right? So you have to get that right, spray right. in. Right, right. And bacterial spots not normally a problem all year long. Okay. I mean, uh, sometimes I've seen it on on plants that were stressed, but but then, like I said, some varieties are going to get it. Right, right. Bacterial spot normally doesn't kill a plant. Nah. You know, you can tolerate quite a bit of bacterial spot. It just looks bad cosmetically is what I tell right. folks. Yeah, it's not going to kill a plant. Right. All right, so thank you for that question, Mike. Uh, here's our next few email. I think you'll like this one. I have a peach and nectarine tree for the fourth season. First, the crops fall in very large numbers, and then the fruit shows tiny holes in them, and they ooze a clear, glue-like, gooey substance. What disease causes oozing from peaches, and what should I use to treat it? Maroon from Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, the oozing, oozing. Uh, sounds like oriental fruit moth. Ah. That's what it sounds mm -hmm. like, which is uh, not the major insect pest, pest on, on, right. on peaches, but uh, it will be controlled if you use a regular mm -hmm. cover spray. Mm -hmm. And But that's what it sounds like. The oozing, sometimes if uh, uh, stink bugs feed on fruit, they up. will ooze a little bit from that kind of injury too, but uh, the difference between uh, stink bug oozing and oriental fruit moth oozing is if you open up the oriental fruit moth infected yeah. peach down around the pit, you'll find the grubs, you know, yeah. the wormy fruit. And that's no fun that's to find. That's no fun. Right? Nah. Especially if you're, if you're <laughs> eating, eating them at the time. Nah. But that's what that sounds like to me. What do you think? No, I thought the same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're spot on with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. just a little, uh, yeah, it's, it's real clear. Mm -hmm. yeah, just a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and it's doing the same thing that it does when it's trying to uh, get rid of peat, you know, the, if, when you have peach tree borers on the trunk of a tree, yeah, yeah. the tree is trying Gamosis. to flush them out. Right. Yeah, trying, trying to, to flush get it them out. out. Right. And that fruit's trying to flush that oriental yeah. fruit moth out. It it's amazing gonna, how trees do that, right? It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. It ain't work. But the thing about the moth, pretty easy to control, you think, though, for the most part? Mm -hmm. if, I think you just follow the regular spray schedule, yeah. and, and it's not going to be a problem. You're not going to see that. Yeah, it's not going to be a problem. The problem you have is if you're trying to follow the regular spray schedule, and it rains every two days. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Right. Well, that's that's the problem. Keep right. them washed off, and right. you never, you know, that, that's, but you got to try. Got to give it a shot. Got to give it a shot. So thank you, Maroon, for that question. Yeah, peaches, plums, and nectarines, right? Mm, <laughs> I think wow. you trained us well mm. with that. So thank you much. We appreciate that. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you need more information on peach problems, including treatment, go to familyplotgarden.com. We also have similar information on apple tree diseases. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.